How many of you have been to uh, Second City? Almost everybody, because it's just across the street. I've been there a bunch of times. And when you go to Second City, uh, professional comedians take the stage, and they take cues from the audience, and they take cues from each other, and they tell a story. And that story, after a few minutes, leads to some sort of a logical conclusion and has a narrative along the way, and hopefully it's entertaining. And they make improvising look really easy. But has anybody ever tried this, gone to an improv class, anybody? Yeah, is it easy? Uh, yes. It is? OK. <laughs> anybody else ever tried it? I think it's really hard. And I think it takes a lot of practice and a lot of discipline, especially if you do it in the business world. And I know this because I've been doing it my entire career. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that's worked for me and maybe give you some, a few tips for your own career. But first, I want to start by defining the word improvise, because a lot of people think it's simply making things up. But I prefer a different definition. It's sort of aligned with the theme for today, and that is taking something ordinary and turning it into something very special, taking the information or the resources you have at hand and then turning that into something really special. And I think this improvising is an incredibly important survival skill, just like evolution that helps us adapt to real-time changes in the biological world. Improvisation helps us adapt to real-time changes in the modern world, which is moving much faster. And today, life is too fast and too complicated for strict ideologies to determine all the decisions that we're making. And I think the future leaders of this world have to learn to play it by ear. And the best way to learn to play it by ear is by exposing yourself. And I, I mean that in the nicest possible <laughs> way. <laughs> I work with a lot of young people in the public relations world, and I worry a little bit about the people that are coming in to the business world today. And they all go to the same colleges. They all take the same courses. They all read the same books. They read the same magazines. They go to the same movies. They watch the TV, same TV shows. And when they come to us, they're sort of a commodity. Meanwhile, our clients like McDonald's and Toyota and Unilever are looking for people with fresh ideas and new perspectives to help them solve some really serious challenges that they're facing as companies. And I sometimes wonder where they're going to find those fresh perspectives and, and new ideas. If they're going to have to look to Brazil or, or India or China, and I hope they don't have to look so far. I grew up in a small town south of here in, called Evansville, Indiana. And I lived a very ordinary life, sort of like uh, Beaver Cleaver in Leave it to Beaver. And this is me on the right. And I almost look a little like he did in those days, don't you think? My dad was a home builder and my mom was a housewife. Every winter, we all piled in the station wagon and drove to Fort Lauderdale for a vacation. And in the summer, like my son Noah, I spent every day playing tennis at the local country club. But this idyllic life sort of changed completely when I was a freshman in high school. I was dozing off in French class when my tennis coach came and knocked on the door and called me out in the hallway and informed me that I had been kicked off the tennis team. And he went on to explain that a mother of a player at another school had reported me to whoever cared about these things for playing in a tournament with a handful of old men over the weekend. And apparently this was against the rules. So not only did they take away my varsity letter, they took, I was undefeated for the season. They made every one of my wins a loss, which meant my team went from first place in the city rankings to last place. Now, unfortunately, this was not covered by ESPN at the time. But it was a very dramatic incident for a 16-year-old kid whose life revolved around hitting a yellow tennis ball every day. And it changed the direction of my life forever. That's when my formal education ended and my life education began. And it began at a place called Arc Lanes, which was a modern entertainment mecca in Evansville next to the mall that had 40 state-of-the-art bowling alleys but most importantly to me, it had 15 Brunswick pool tables. 
And I was very good looking back then, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> um, so I traded out my faculty at Harrison High School for a new faculty at Arc Lanes, which was made up of dropout and juvenile delinquents with names like Baby Pod, Fat Beckham, and Red Dog. My wife Cheryl knows some of these people. <laughs> and instead of teaching math and science and um, English, they taught me cruising, drinking, smoking, hustling, and sex. But I wasn't very good at, in that last subject. <laughs> but I learned a lot at Arc Lanes. And one of the things I learned that has stayed with me forever is that people do not come up with new ideas out of the clear blue sky. You think of ideas based on the experiences and the information you already have stored away in your brain. And the new ideas you come up with you, is, is because you connect those experiences and that information in new and different ways. And that's the basis for creativity as demonstrated by this very scientific chart of pool balls. If you've only had a couple of experiences and you only have a couple of ideas in your head, you don't have many options. But if you have lots of experience, lots of ideas, you have lo un your options are really unlimited. And I work in a creative business and ideas are very, very important. And I always have more ideas than everybody else. And it's not because I'm better educated or I'm smarter, because I'm not. It's because I have more balls. <laughs> I like to think of your life as like a magazine rack, the kind you'd see at the O'Hare Airport. I don't know if any of you read magazines anymore, but when you're standing in front of one the next time, instead of reaching out and getting People magazine or Sports Illustrated or Fortune or whatever you normally read, pick something different. Pick something you have never read before, like Inked, which is about tattoos, or Guns and Ammo, which is about guns and ammo, <laughs> or, or my favorite, which is called Scrapbooking and Beyond. It's a titillating publication. But the, my point is, every time you open a new magazine, you're opening a world of people that you have never met before, who have different passions and different ideas and different thoughts that you don't have. And these people may be your customers someday, they may be your friends, they may be your co-workers. And you can apply that same magazine principle to television shows, to movies, to food, to any aspect of your life, to experiment a little and try new things. And that's how you expose yourself. And it's important because it's the only way that you can stay relevant with the rest of the world, with everything that's going on. And it's particularly important as you get older. We just returned from our spring break vacation in Hawaii, where we've stayed at the same hotel 12 different times. My wife asks for the same room, and she goes down every morning and gets the same chairs by the pool that we've had every single year. Now, this is all very comforting and comfortable, but doing the same thing over and over sort of calcifies your creativity. You have to step outside of your comfort zone in order to stay relevant. And one way to stay relevant and to get out of your comfort zone is to start your own business. We all know who Mark Zuckerberg is because we all saw the movie Social Network. And we know that in 2011, he sold Facebook, took it public, and it's now worth more than $200 billion. And do you remember what Mark Zuckerberg was doing when he invented Facebook? Anybody from the movie? What was he doing? Come on. Yeah. I'm going to guess driving drunk people. Well, he was drunk, <laughs> which was when you have your best ideas. <laughs> but now, what was, he, what was he doing? What was he doing in his life? What? Wasn't he trying to pick up women? Yeah, he was pick up women. But where was, where was he? College. He was in college. All the best ideas come from people in college. Bill Gates was in college. Michael Dell was in college. Sergey Brin was in college. Neil Blumenthal was in college when he invented Warby Parker. Fred Smith was in college when he invented FedEx. All the best ideas come from people in college, but they're improvising. They have no idea. Mark Zuckerberg was trying to get his girlfriend back. He had no idea he was building this great company. He took something very ordinary and made it very, very special. My version of Facebook was called 
sober chauffeur, a discreet service for the drinking class. <laughs> the idea was simple. I lived in Los Angeles where people drink a lot and they drive a lot. And if you called sober chauffeur, we would come and pick you up and drive you home in your own car. And then we'd have another driver follow that driver and pick him up after he dropped you off. Today it would have been Uber. Back then, not quite so much. But the reaction was immediate. Everybody loved the idea. Every newspaper in Los Angeles did a story about Sober Chauffeur. They interviewed me in my basement office in my, in my uh, house in Echo Park. I was on every television station in, in the city. Radio stations from all over the world called to interview me about Sober Chauffeur. And the Wall Street Journal wrote on the front page of the magazine that it was the best idea they'd ever heard coming out of crazy California. But there was one tiny little glitch in my business plan. And I have a book, a copy of my book, that I will give to the person who can guess what that glitch was. What do you think it was? What was the problem? Yes? Did you have a DUI? No, that didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> you don't have that judgment to call you? All my clients were drunk. <laughs> exactly. You win the book, right? Gotham. Um, if you start a business, I suggest that you not base it on drunk people. <laughs> because what happens is they call you at 6 o'clock at night, and they tell you they're going out, and they're going to call you later, and then they get drunk, and they forget, and they never call. So after two years of waiting for the phone to ring, I closed down Sober Chauffeur. And was I a failure? Yes, I was a complete failure. The business was bankrupt. I didn't make any money. I had wasted a lot of time. But I had been the CEO of my own company. I had been the chief marketing officer. I was the head of HR. I hired, hired all the drivers. And I also was the spokesperson on, for the, all these media outlets. So I learned a lot. But most importantly, I learned how to be an entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs are really hot right now in school and in the business world. And all of entrepreneurs are improvisers. They're all, they all, none of them really know what they're doing. They start whether with a tea company or another idea, and they figure it out along the way. And all of you have ideas. I know everyone in this room has an idea, but a lot of times we don't pursue them because we're afraid to fail. But my suggestion is give it a try and see what happens. Even if it fails like me, you'll learn a lot that you can apply to your own life or to another job or maybe even guiding a tour. Big businesses, unlike entrepreneurs, rely on predictability. They look for long-term plans and sales charts that lead them to some great success in the future years. But what happens along the way if they lose their direction? Sometimes they have to improvise. They don't have the research. They don't have the knowledge. They have to make decisions about where they're going based on the information in their hands and the feelings in their gut. And I learned to travel without a map as a tour guide. When my days of driving drunks were over, I thought it would be fun to do something else, and I thought taking people on tours would be a great job. But there were two problems. I had never been on a tour before, much less have guided one. But I improvised. I used my experience as a cabin boy and as a doorman and as a sober chauffeur. And I wrote a resume that described me as the perfect travel industry expert. And I sent it out to all the tour companies in America. And the biggest one, Olson Tours, called me three weeks later without an interview and asked me if I would guide their California adventure tour. And this is me. I'm always on the right. That's me on the right. And this certainly was an adventure, because it went to Yosemite, it went to San Francisco, it went to Sacramento, it went to Big Sur, and I had never been to any of these places before. <laughs> so every night when these poor people who had paid a lot of money for this tour were in bed, I was sitting up with about a dozen tour guide books that I had checked out of the library before we left, reading about the places we were going to go the next day, so I could stand in front of the bus and tell them how high Bridal Veil Falls were, how many people were involved in the gold rush. And as you might imagine, I was not a very good tour guide. But I learned something really important in this process, and that is with a little homework and a little imagination, I could convince almost anybody 
of almost anything, except maybe this guy. I had the pressure of working with Steve Jobs, who I think is one of the great improvisers of all times. Steve did not believe in research. He even said, why would I ask people what they want and then try to build it? Because by the time I do, they won't want it anymore. So he didn't care what anybody else thought except his own opinions. But Steve wasn't an inventor. He did not invent the MP3 player. He did not invent the laptop computer. He did not invent the smartphone. He did not invent the smart watch. He took what was already available and he made those things special. But he was a great marketer, a great brand builder. And when we worked with him in our business, one of the most mundane things we do is we create sort of a media plan. And we talked about the outlets that we're going to go to, the stories we're going to pitch, and the reporter that we're going to pitch them to. Most CEOs would never bother to even pay any attention to this, but Steve Jobs sat in every meeting and went through this media plan in great detail. And when we get to certain outlets, he would say, that's mine. And what he meant by that is that he was going to call that reporter and he was going to pitch the story. And I have never met a CEO before or since that had the intelligence to realize how important it was to build those kinds of relationships. And not only would he pitch the story, but he would demand that he be on the cover of the publication. And his favorite magazine, which is sort of surprising given he was the guy that sort of invented all the devices for social media, his favorite magazine was Time Magazine, and he convinced them to put him on the cover eight different times including the week that he died. Steve followed a different path than everyone else, and because of that, he was always ahead of the competition and usually ahead of the consumer. And I think all of us need to follow our own paths too, because today, we live in a world where technology and media and politics change more quickly than Facebook profiles. So sometimes being the president of a company or being the president of a country is a little bit like being a tour guide who doesn't know where he's going. All of you have heard that the business world is full of rules, and most people succeed by following them. This journey, usually they, they make their quarterly numbers, they fit into the corporate culture, and they manage not to get fired. This journey often begins at an Ivy League college with a stop off at Brooks Brothers for some cool clothes. <laughs> the BMW dealer for a nice car, and then a lot of times on the golf course to lower your handicap. But what happens if you don't have all of these credentials or these opportunities? How do you get into this elite corporate fraternity if you don't have all that stuff? Well, it took me a long time to find that out. When, when all of my various business ventures had failed, I had to fall back on my... Um, degree in college, which might surprise you, was in education. And uh, I got a job as a substitute school teacher in the Los Angeles Unified School District. This is me right here on the right. Um, and I would, in, in LA, they would pay you combat pay to teach in the, in the, in the really bad neighborhoods. So I st taught in the worst schools in Los Angeles, any subject, auto mechanics, home economics, whatever it was. And a good day, as they said before, was when nobody got injured. And at night, I would drive my motorcycle across town and I took courses in PR in the night school at UCLA. And when I was 36, I got my first real job in public relations at a small agency in downtown LA. You can't probably make me out. Uh, can you see, anybody see where I am in this right, picture? Huh? Yeah, right. I was in the back row. This was the day this company was bought by the company I work for now, which was called Golan Harris. And there was a reason I was in the back row, because nobody in this picture, including Al Golan in front, ever thought I would be the CEO of this company. <laughs> I had barely graduated from college. I had never taken a business course. I rode to work on a motorcycle. I typed with two fingers, and I still do. And I didn't know if the Giants were a football team or a baseball team. I have since learned that the, they are both, right? Yeah. 
But I had learned something really important. I had learned how to improvise. And so at every level of this company, I was able to sort of reinvent myself for that next job and be successful at it until about 10 years ago, they made me the CEO and we moved to Chicago. And now, instead of being bought, we get to buy companies. This is a picture of a company we bought in, in London, a healthcare firm. And I get to be in the front row and I get to have a glass of wine. So things are much better than, than they used to be. But I, the, the nice thing is I still get to improvise. As Remy said, I just took a job heading the uh, public relations program at the University of Southern California. And once again, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like the woman in the video said, You're, I'm not supposed to be here. And it occurs to me every time at USC I say the same thing to myself. But I'm sort of figuring it out along the way. And I think that eventually I will figure out how to, how to do it. But it's, it's sort of exercising new parts of my brain and my personality and keeping me relevant by spending all these time with young kids that are learning my profession. So it's been fun, and I'm looking forward to more of it. But my point is that it takes courage to, to make up your own rules. It takes courage to, to improvise. But courage, and I think somebody said in one of these videos, it's incremental. You build it with little bricks, one step at a time. First, you read a different magazine that you've never read before. And then maybe you take in a foreign film that, that you've never heard of. Or you go to a Korean restaurant and you ask for the spiciest thing on the menu. Or you write a plan for your boss that he didn't ask you for. Or you write a wild, crazy letter to a company you've always wanted to work for. And don't worry if you fail. When I was a doorman, I was fired twice. When I was um, a school teacher, I flunked. When I was a tour guide, I was lost. I was kicked off the tennis team. And the very first night of Sober Chauffeur, I was peddling the company to the high-end restaurants and bars in Beverly Hills. And I had beautiful business cards and brochures, and I would go into each one, and I would talk to the bartender about this wonderful service for his customers. And I would have a glass of wine with him, and he would get all excited about it. And then I would go to the next bar and repeat the same thing. And over the course of the evening, the bartenders got more and more excited, and I got more and more inebriated. And I'm driving down Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills, and I look in my rearview mirror, and the red light is flashing. And I am taken to the Beverly Hills Jail for the night. Has anybody ever been to the Beverly Hills Jail? It's a, as you might imagine, it is a pretty nice jail. <laughs> and my cell had a window in it, so I could sit and watch as the police officers passed around my business card and my brochure to each other, <laughs> laughing their asses off because they had arrested the sober chauffeur for drunk driving. <laughs> but I learned from all of these things that failure doesn't kill you. It just gives you more courage to go on and do something else. And my, my final point is really to everyone. Your career and your life is the sum total of your experiences, not your promotions and your salary increases. So I encourage all of you, whether you're just starting out or you're further along in your career, to do everything you can to make it special. Thank you. <laughs>